science with a love of evolutionary biology. Um, and I also knew at, at the same time that I wanted to do science that helped um, solve problems. So I don't think many people know that there's this field of applied evolutionary biology, but that was uh, just a really great fit um, from the start for me. So my background is, like Norm said, in invasion biology, and then I did a postdoc um, looking at gene flow issues and conservation biology. Um, we have uh, speakers in the symposium who are going to talk about uh, agriculture, conservation biology, uh, environmental sciences, and I'm here to talk about how gene flow science can inform uh, the policy domain. So my, my work transitioned when I joined the government. And I am focused now, as Norm said, on, on how science informs environmental policy. So I'll, I'll just sort of say, in general, there are, there are multiple ways that scientific information can contribute. Um, there's the area of policy development, which is essentially uh, providing objective answers to questions that, it can form, that can inform development of laws or regulations under laws or um, guidance for conforming to regulations. I'll also mention that science is usually just one of many considerations that contribute to policy development. Um, and that the opportunities for science to contribute arise for different reasons. They can inform uh, single decision makers or multiple decision makers in more of a negotiation setting. Um, I'll also mention that uh, scientific information can contribute to determinations under existing policy, but this is largely under the purview of uh, regulatory offices. Uh, it's not my area of expertise. I'm in um, the environmental policy, um, the, uh, uh, the area of, of research and development, so more on, on the science side, not on, on the policy side currently. Um, so I'm going to talk about the work in two areas of the Environmental Protection Agency where science has helped inform the agency's interpretation uh, and responsibilities under certain laws. Um, before I get to the specifics, though, um, I want to talk a little bit about how science and policy interact in general. So there are several models by which this process can take place. Um, one model is where there is essentially no meaningful communication across the boundary. Um, this kind of speaking truth to power model in which scientists perceive the interface as a linear, one-way transmittal of scientific knowledge, usually through uh, publication in scientific journals. And it's equivalent to a very low permeability inter interface, where scientists don't try and understand policy needs, and policymakers can't, or uh, uh, can't understand or make good use um, of the available science. And I would submit to you that the result of this kind of a process is that both sides feel or are misunderstood in many cases. Um, I'll also mention that a lot of this thinking about science policy interface um, uh, comes from William Clark at uh, Harvard University. He's a MacArthur Genius Award winner, and um, he's got some really, really nice papers um, on this topic. So if you're interested, um, in this type of work, uh, I would definitely check out um, his papers. So the second model is more of an overlapping model. Um, and this is one in which policymakers and um, scientists tend to trespass on each other's areas of expertise, uh, consciously or unconsciously develop an agenda, uh, potentially misrepresent information from the other domain. So I would, I would submit that when the science policy interface is too permeable, the credibility of policymakers and scientists can be reduced. Um, a quote from uh, one of Clark's papers, if the boundary is too porous, personal opinions mixed with validated facts, science gets messed with politics, and the special value of research-based knowledge fails to materialize. So is there a better way? Um, yes. <laughs> this is something called boundary work. Um, the, the roots of this are in social science. Um, and this is really, um, it's, it's kind of been an eye-opener um, for me to see this, um, this 
process um, formalized in a way that, you know, we've just sort of been doing whatever way we could figure out how to do it um, within my line of work. So boundary work signifies the processes through which the research community organizes its relations with the world of action and policy making and with practice based on other forms of knowledge. And these processes allow the worlds to understand each other. The idea in boundary work is to construct and manage the science policy interface, to turn useful knowledge into influential knowledge, um, where the knowledge itself um, possesses several qualities, in, in, uh, including salience that is relevant to policy needs and questions, that it's credible, that it's scientifically adequate, made up of evidence and arguments, um, and that it's legitimate, that it's unbiased and respectful of all points of view. Um, so, I, my, my question that I'm addressing for this talk is, how has or could plant gene flow science contribute to policy development? The two examples I'm going to be discussing, uh, the first is transgenic crop regulation in the United States, and the second is protection of streams and wetlands. Um, also in the U.S., but I think there is um, certainly a wider application. <laughs> there are many other policy areas uh, where I think gene flow science um, could, could conform these areas, and I think they're worth thinking about. Um, some of you may immediately think about the U.S. Endangered Species Act, and there really is an ongoing role of gene flow there and understanding, you know, what is a population, what is a subpopulation, and what is the unit worth uh, conserving and affording protections to. Um, transgenic crop regulation under um, policies in other countries, I'll touch on that. Uh, prevention of invasive species introduction or spread, and protection of biological communities resilient to climate change. So just a little bit of background. Um, there's documented gene flow between 22 out of 25 of the most important crops and their wild and greedy relatives. Um, one of these crops is shown here, that's cotton. This tends to happen where both crop and relatives are native, but not always. And it has important implications for movement of transgenes from crops to wild populations. Um, so the FIFRA, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, is the current policy context for the Environmental Protection Agency's interest in plant gene flow. Um, there are other laws and regulations that apply to transgenic crops, uh, and I'm not going to discuss those today. Um, so the movement of transgenes from the host plant into weeds has been a significant concern due to the possibility of novel exposures to a pesticidal substance. And the pesticidal substance in this case are the cry proteins from Bacillus thuringiensis um, that are produced by the transgenic crop. And there's kind of a reasonable argument for a parallel um, between pesticide drift, which is you, know, you apply a chemical pesticide and it ends up in places that you didn't want it to go, <laughs> uh, and movement of transgenes and their pesticidal substances um, into wild populations. So that's kind of the, um, uh, the reasoning there. Um, so FIFRA directs the US EPA to examine all unreasonable adverse effects upon man and the environment, which includes those which may arise from gene flow of plant incorporated protectants, um, we call them PIPs, um, to wild or feral populations of sexually compatible plants. So the current law focuses on unreasonable adverse effects as kind of the, the end point of interest. So if the action of the PIP transgene results in what's determined to be an unreasonable adverse effect um, upon man or the environment, then actions under FIFRA as a pesticide would be warranted. However, science cannot determine what is an unreasonable adverse effect. So what role does science play in this case? So the, the boundary work, the science policy boundary work, uh, in this instance has taken place um, at meetings of EPA's FIFRA Scientific Advisory Panel. Uh, it's made up of scientists that are not affiliated with the agency. And uh, so that's the one part of the boundary, the science part of the boundary. Um, and the policy uh, part of the boundary is, is played by regulators in EPA's Office of Chemical Safety and Pollution Prevention. And, way, and the way this works is that EPA writes a series of scientific charge questions, um, issues that they're interested in uh, developing policy around, 
and then the panel answers them. And I should say that um, the regulators, my colleagues, attempt to make the questions scientific, but occasionally um, they have their regulator hat on and the panel has to do some amount of translation into questions that are actually answerable um, using scientific methods. Um, so the role of science here is to identify uh, possible effects. You know what, I'm gonna stop and go back real quick. So the, the nature of the boundary interaction here is pretty specific. There are specific questions that the science panel is asked to address, and it's fairly discreet. So there are meetings of the scientific advisory panel um, with the, the regulators in um, EPA's pesticide office. Um, it doesn't mean it's a one-time thing. Um, there have been several panels convened to talk about the topic of gene flow, um, but they tend to be points in time, uh, and it's not an ongoing process. Okay, I wanted to make sure I got that in there. Uh, so the role of science in this case is to identify possible effects without regard to what might be considered unreasonable or adverse, and then to identify what information would be needed to understand the possibility or likelihood of identified effects. So what ends up being a key question is, what is the potential for gene flow? And the scientific advisory panel has weighed in on the evidence one would need to assess this question, some of these sub-questions um, you see here. Um, they've also offered up the kinds of data that could be collected to answer these questions, including surveys of locations of wild relatives, natural history observations about flowering characteristics, and of course results from uh, controlled crossing experiments. So if there is no possibility of gene flow, there are no possible effects. Um, and according to currently available information, EPA has determined that uh, the potential for gene flow is extremely low in corn and potato uh, in the U.S. So those crops that contain um, pips are not necessarily subject um, to, to uh, restrictions under the law. So the second um, role that science plays uh, in this particular topic is what are the potential effects of gene flow and what kind of information we needed to understand their likelihood. So if there is a potential for gene flow, this is the next question you might ask. And the scientific advisory panel has offered some thoughts about understanding um, the interaction between escape transgenics and the surrounding communities. Um, and the kinds of information you might collect to answer some of these questions, um, including the include the presence of pests and diseases in wild populations, as well as the presence of other community members, um, otherwise known in this context as non-target organisms. And what might, ha what might happen or does happen uh, when you have gene flow. So there are um, other possible effects related to potential invasiveness and uh, effects on threatened or endangered species um, as well, and that's what these uh, questions represent. So just a couple um, of other issues uh, that I want to raise. There's um, an interesting twist to uh, FIFRA, this law, and that it's a, a risk-benefit statute. Um, so when making a decision about a transgenic crop and whether it's, um, it has or doesn't have unreasonable adverse effects and is okay for registration and use, science um, underlying the understanding of risk and gene flow and possible effects is not the only consideration. Um, so you could tie up all the science in a nice tidy bundle and you would still have another step, which is a comparison of what environmental impacts and economic benefits may be realized or lost on the basis of the use of the proposed product. So you package up your science, and then the regulators have got to weigh it against other things like economics. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that, that this law is specific to the US, and other countries where transgenic crops are grown, Canada, here in Brazil, others, they have different policies. Um, uh, and these different policies, they could could drive the need for similar scientific information or different scientific information. So there may be some of you that actually understand this better than I do at this point. My information is a little bit dated. Um, but Brazil's Biosecurity Commission, that is the CT and Bio, uh, they have a, a resolution, normative resolution number 05, that contains a specific requirement to look at gene transfer from a transgenic crop to the same species or other sexually compatible species. 
So it's actually written into the law. It's a specific requirement to, to understand this, this side of using transgenic crops. Whereas in the US, it's, it's an interpretation of the existing law that was written when we had no such thing as transgenic crops. So I just thought I'd bring that up um, as an interesting comparison there. OK, so I'll move on to my next topic, and that is protection of streams and wetlands under the US Clean Water Act. A um, little bit of background here, water, res about re water resources and gene flow. Dispersal and migration within and between watersheds can play an important role in the demographic persistence, community assembly, and evolution of aquatic species. In general, our knowledge about gene flow in aquatic settings is much better for animals than plants. We know a lot more about gene flow in fish species, um, to some extent insects, um, and much less information about plant gene flow in these settings. Uh, we know a lot more about gene flow within habitat types, so uh, within stream networks. Um, we know more about that than between habitat type movement, that is movement, um, say, between uh, wetlands and, and stream networks. Uh, the connectivity of water bodies, including the movement of organisms, is important for meaning both inter- and intraspecific um, diversity. So here's the policy context for this topic. Um, so in 1972, the Clean Water Act uh, was passed in the U.S. And it afforded federal protections which were intended to be broadly inclusive of streams, wetlands, and other water bodies. Uh, but this, this interpretation of a, of a broad scope of the law uh, was open to court challenges. Um, you know, I, I feel this very acutely, but the Environmental Protection Agency gets sued a lot. Um, so we were taken to, to court numerous times under um, challenging our interpretation, our broad interpretation of the Clean Water Act. Um, two of the most important cases went all the way to the Supreme Court in 2001 and in 2006. And that forced the agency to, to rethink its interpretation of what kinds of streams and wetlands uh, were protected under this law. So it turns out that small streams and wetlands according to the courts, uh, must be physically, chemically, and or biologically connected to large lakes and or rivers and have significant effects on those large lakes or rivers uh, to be afforded protections under the law. So this idea of connectivity became the central scientific focus of national water policy decisions. Um, and, you know, the, the word connectivity isn't one that we really use in gene flow science, but I think there's a very clear, um, a very a clear association between these between these ideas. So the, the role of, of um, gene flow science is different than in the last example, uh, where the measurement of gene flow and its potential effects are of direct interest. Um, here, the interest is connectivity, which includes movement and functions of, of all kinds of materials. Uh, including water, which has really been the, the focus um, of interpretation under the law, chemicals, nutrients, but includes the movement of organisms. Uh, and we understand that the gene flow is a great way to, to keep track of them. So um, this is the kind of work that took place um, between, uh, on the science side, uh, EPA's Office of Research and Development, and on the policy side, EPA's Office of Water. Um, there are a lot of activities that took place independently within each domain, and then the boundary work itself. So the boundary work involved the organization and management of the interface between these two bodies, um, so that the, the salient information about processes and the expertise of both sides um, of the boundary is conveyed across a, what we would call permeable interface. And it's important that the, the boundary is permeable, but that it also maintains its integrity. So this kind of work um, is a little bit different than the last example. Um, the, the topics were more general and conceptual. The policymakers in this case did not have specific scientific questions in mind that they even knew how to ask. <laughs> we worked a lot with lawyers in this case, and lawyers have legal language, and so we were responsible in this case for, for translating that into questions we could answer 
um, with science. This was also a very iterative process. You know, we're talking about like weekly meetings to try and get on the same page about, you know, what kind of science we were pulling together and why they needed that kind of science and not another kind of science because of some of the, the legal, um, some of the legal kind of restrictions that they were under. It was, so there, there were a lot of meetings in this case. So that, that, that was very different from the last example I presented. So the role of science in this situation was to achieve a set of objectives, which were developed in direct response to the needs of the policymakers resulting from, from the legal context. Um, this information would not necessarily have ever been organized this way um, without the specific legal drivers in place, that is, the law, the Clean Water Act, and the court challenges. Um, so we were, we were tasked with providing a conceptual framework for understanding watershed connectivity, synthesizing evidence uh, about pathways and functions by which streams and wetlands affect physical, chemical, and biological integrity. Um, and I'll, I'm gonna try and highlight functions and biological integrity examples related to gene flow in our, in our findings. Uh, and then identify factors that influence connectivity. And this was an interesting one, informed development of regulatory categories of waters based on strength um, and effects of connectivity. We were successful in some place, cases, not in others. So there are five major conclusions in what you might call the boundary object that is our report uh, um, on the science that answers those questions. The first major conclusion is that streams, individually or cumulatively, exert a strong influence on the integrity um, of downstream waters. So the literature provides robust evidence that streams are biologically connected to downstream waters by the dispersal and migration of aquatic and semi-aquatic organisms, including fish, amphibians, plants, microorganisms, invertebrates, etc., etc. So the example of gene flow that appears um, under this conclusion um, is that downstream populations of yellow pond lily were genetically more diverse than upstream populations. Uh, the hypothesis here being that rhizomes detached and dispersed downstream so um, that the genetic diversity within all of the populations upstream were represented in, in downstream populations. And that, um, that shows both um, connectivity of populations and an effect in terms of the amount of genetic diversity within populations. So our second major conclusion was that wetlands and open waters and riparian areas and floodplains are physically, chemically, and biologically integrated um, with rivers. So riparian wetlands provide nursery habitat for breeding fish and amphibians, colonization opportunities for stream invertebrates, invertebrates and maturation habitat for stream insects. So the, the, the biological integration of riparian wetlands and stream networks was really more from an ecological and, and natural history kind of point of view. And we didn't find many studies of gene flow, um, even though studies of gene flow between riparian wetlands and stream networks would have absolutely been applicable. So third, wetlands and open waters and non-floodplain landscape settings provide numerous functions that benefit downstream water integrity. Um, and although we know that these, uh, that these functions exist, there are very few scientific studies um, in general, let, let alone studies of gene flow, that explicitly address connections between non-floodplain wetlands and river networks that have been published in a peer-reviewed literature. Um, and then some other effects about connectivity being along the continuum um, and incremental effects of, of small streams and wetlands being cumulative across watersheds. So these findings directly contributed to the development of the Clean Water Rule, uh, which was released by the agency in May. And the rule clarifies the jurisdiction of the Clean Water Act in part um, based on the science. Uh, if you're interested in the rule, I might be able to speak to you a little bit about that afterwards, but uh, I'm not the expert, so I might point you to one of my colleagues in the, in the policy office. A lot of um, questions that remain open um, as a result of our work, uh, and some of these I think there is a, a real role for gene flow um, to, to play a part. 
So some of these are new research avenues uh, in, the, in the biological conductivity vein that require new field research, and there's definitely a need to build new syntheses using um, the existing information. A number of these, uh, as I mentioned earlier, highlight the need for better information about biological conductivity and gene flow across habitat, habitat types, specifically between uh, wetlands and tree networks, if it indeed does exist. Um, these questions are less specific than the questions about transgene flow and potential impacts from transgene flow on the surrounding environment, and that could reflect uh, the state of the science. Um, I also have a feeling it, it reflects the interest of the policymakers, um, and their interest really has been about how water connects different kinds of, uh, say, streams and rivers or wetlands and, and rivers. Um, and, and, and the rule with the, was based on all kinds of evidence, not just the physical, but the chemical and the biological um, information as well. Um, but I just have this feeling <laughs> that if we answer some of these questions, they might take a greater interest in how biological connectivity can inform their work. Um, and, I, and I think that that makes it worth going forward with. Um, we won't really know until some of this work is conducted. Um, I, just one other thing about uh, connectivity. Connectivity does play a role in, in policy in other places, and the European Union has provided some guidance about how uh, landscape connectivity can inform protections of flora and fauna. Um, they re released a, a report in 2007 um, that I have not, I haven't read all of it yet but I feel like there's a good parallel there. If you have other examples you can kind of think of, um, I'd be interested to, to talk to you about those as well. Uh, so my last slide, uh, just to conclude, gene flow science can and has contributed to policy development at the EPA. It can be of direct interest in the case of uh, transgene flow, or it can be of indirect interest and in conjunction with science and other disciplines, as in the case of conductivity of water resources. And finally, boundary work between science and policy takes place in a variety of ways and has the potential to result in salient, credible, and legitimate scientific information for policy development. And I'll go ahead and stop there. Thanks. Okay, there is time for a couple questions. Carly, uh, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting information about the science and the, the policy. Yeah? I just uh, think about um, how about the public? Do you think about the gene flow issue uh, affected by or concerned by public? Because uh, in China, for example, the transgene issue really uh, concerned by public really affect our policy uh, in terms of uh, develop, development of transgenic crops. How, how, what is, what's your thought about that? That, that? That's a really good point. So that's another one of those areas of consideration, you know, science, economics, pu public opinion too. And in fact, um, those, the scientific advisory panel meetings are open to the public, and public, the public is invited to submit their own um, ideas on, on those topics. Um, you know, I, I, I can't exactly say how public opinion figures into the, the final call, you know, final policy call, but it is something that the agency um, has to consider. Um, Carolyn, that was a very interesting talk in general. Um, I, I was, had just sort of a, a question that's a little more personal than that, is that as um, academic jobs are more scarce, um, there's a lot more interest, and as grant funding percentages mm -hmm. decline, Many more students are interested in, in sort of government and NGO positions and so forth. And I, I'm curious, uh, sort of twofold here, how did you get your job at the uh, EPA and how would you advise students to um, obtain positions, let's say, at the EPA or other government uh, agencies? Yeah. Um, so, uh, kind of going in cold is probably the hardest way to try and do that. Um, I came in through a fellowship program run by the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And they do a science and technology policy fellowship for two years, where scientists, honestly, at any stage in your career, you can be early, you have to have your degree. Um, 
but you can be just kind of starting out your scientific career or be quite far along and, and spend some time in government. Um, once you're there, people know you and they know what you can do. There's a much higher likelihood that they'll want you to stay. So that kind of foot in the door is really important. There are lots of other fellowship programs too for joining the, the government in the U.S. Um, so yeah, I would encourage people to look at those um, those opportunities. There are also um, federal um, postdoc positions, um, quite a few of those, and that's another way to, to put your foot in the door. Um, and I mean, this may, I don't know if this sounds trivial or not, but you, you have to develop a network. You know, you have to stay in touch with the people who have left your lab. You have to, you know, if you serve on a, on a grant panel, you have to stay in touch with those people. Um, it really is about finding the opportunities through your, through your network. So, I think it's doable. I think we've been through a really rough period of hiring in the federal government. We're past it. So, there may actually be jobs opening for people.